you know, for the last uh, five sessions, we've been painting a picture of this country during my formative years, as they were often uh, paralleling formative years of this country as well, in the life of our country. Our, th our first three sessions uh, were of an often troubled, sometimes exciting uh, America, but one at peace. Uh, the last uh, two have been of an America at war. Today, uh, this session I turn 15, and uh, the war suddenly ends. But before the paint runs dry in her portrait, we'll conclude these reflections with uh, the most formative happening of all, one whose ramifications are with us every day of our lives, the dropping of the atomic bomb. Now, writer C.P. Snow once uh, described Albert Einstein as a uh, reliable old, looking like a reliable old Swiss watchmaker, one who perhaps collects butterflies on Sunday. When I was growing up, every kid seemed to have heard of uh, Albert Einstein. His name had become part of the vernacular. Uh, what do you think? You're an Einstein? You know, it was, uh, it was synonymous with genius. But critical to our story today, his face was as well known as his name. Mothers who dreamed of their offspring going on to greater glory as scientists might paste pictures of the old reliable Swiss watchmaker carefully cut out of the rotogravure section of Sunday's newspaper on the kid's bedroom wall. Maybe, they thought, just maybe it would aspire him uh, to aspire to a Nobel Prize in physics. And, uh, help himself, dig himself out of the desperate hole they were all in, mired uh, deep in the Depression. Those pictures on bedroom walls and elsewhere would make Einstein's face one of the most recognizable in our country, despite the absence of television, uh, despite the absence of the internet, Facebook, Twitter. And that fact, curiously enough, would prove fortuitous for our country in a very significant way but utterly unforeseeable way as well, which leads to our story, Einstein, the letter in the bomb. Now, sometimes it seems the fate of mankind is left to happenstance, times fortuitous, uh, other times disastrous, sometimes apparently random and chaotic, at other times seemingly ordered as part of a uh, preordained continuum. Something of all of this and the lifeline, lifelong struggle of Albert Einstein to discover an ordered universe. God, said Einstein repeatedly, would not play dice with the universe. Einstein's later years, however, were preoccupied with a searing moral dilemma, which consumed not only Einstein, but many of his former colleagues as well on both sides of the Atlantic. Their research following on Einstein's re remarkable discoveries leading inexorably to the cataclysm that they all dreaded. The diverse characters and the chance happenings which in, ensued in this dramatic passion play are indeed absorbing. So I've chosen to tell you about two meetings at Channel Apart in uh, 1919 summer and two journeys, an ocean apart in the critical summer of 1939 had a shattering impact on the balance of the 20th century. Ramifications <clears throat> very much with us today. Ordinarily, the story of Einstein would, of course, uh, begin in the year 1905, his accomplishments, when Einstein, then employed as the third class Swiss patent clerk, discovered the theory of relativity, a theory which would ultimately revolutionize the world of physics. But I choose instead to begin on both sides of the English Channel in the year 1919, the year of Versailles. The year we discussed at length in our fourth session on the coming of the war in the Pacific and in our second session on Alfred Bosch, Frederick L. Schumann, and of course the origins of National Socialism. The year of a demoralized, moribund Germany, a once proud nation now suffering amidst the remnants of a war that had failed. In the summer of that year, as I was to learn from Bosch, as you know, and Schumann, as we discussed in our second session, a psychotically disturbed drifter, a former failed artist from Vienna, uh, accepted an invitation to attend a political party meeting in the Munich Beer Hall, beer hall with four rather muddle-headed, pathetic men sitting around a broken table under a gas lamp, a meeting 
he would later describe in my account as the most fateful decision of his life. But during that same year of 1919, another crucial meeting was taking place. This one across the channel. The Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society in London had just verified Einstein's now new generalized theory of relativity during a solar eclipse on May 29, just before Hitler's chance meeting with Anton, Anton Drexler's pathetic little group. The societies would announce their findings to the world in November, and the fame of the former Swiss patent clerk, a third class, was now destined to spread exponentially. The name Einstein was now to become synonymous with genius the world over. He had already shocked the scientific world with his theory of relativity in 1905, but now the Royal Academy would add its imprimatur by describing Einstein's newest discovery as one of the greatest achievements in the history of human thought, and announced his insight, quote, had changed the Newtonian world of science and created a new understanding of time and of space, end quote. <coughs> Ironically, the theory of relativity would not earn Einstein a Nobel Prize, but the event made it clear he could not be denied that honor, and it was finally granted to him for his work on the photoelectric effect uh, later, uh, two years later, 1921. So two seemingly unrelated meetings. What about the seemingly unrelated journeys? Just 20 years later, in the summer of 1939, two seemingly unrelated journeys took place, this time oceans apart. By August 23, 1939, as we know, that pathetic little Munich Beer Hall group, having changed his name to the NSDAP for short, was not only in full control of Germany and Austria, but more relevant to our story, was now in control of Czechoslovakia as well. Rearmed Germany would force many of the world's leading physicists with Jewish roots such as Einstein, Leo Gillard of Hungary, and significantly 14 other Nobel laureates uh, in all to flee many to the United States. Ironically, uh, a major factor that would ultimately give us and not Germany uh, the atomic bomb. <clears throat> At 10 p.m. Berlin time on August 21, 1939, uh, the Reich Chancellery announced that Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop uh, would journey from Berlin to Moscow that very night to sign a non-aggression pact with the heretofore perfidious Soviet Union. Pact dated August 23, 1939, signed shortly after midnight on that day by the Soviet and German foreign ministers, contained a secret protocol uh, placing the eastern half of Poland uh, within the uh, Soviet uh, orbit, together with the Baltic states and Finland, the western half of Poland within the Nazi orbit, uh, including Gdansk or Danzig, it is now known, as it's now known. Hitler, now primed to invade Poland, assumed uh, that Britain would not intervene, continued in this delusion, notwithstanding the fact that on, on August 25th, only two days later, Lord Halifax and the Polish ambassador concluded the Anglo-Polish Treaty of Mutual Assistance. Hitler, undaunted, announced uh, to the German generals that he was now 50 years old, and he wanted to test the Wehrmacht in a baptism of fire uh, in war before he reached the age of 55. In September 1, he would invade Poland uh, with uh, a million and a half men. <coughs> France would follow a declaration of war against Germany, ominously and critical to our story, Germany would now issue an order forbidding the export of uranium from Czechoslovakia, which leads me to our next critical 1939 journey. Only three weeks before, during that same summer of 1939, summer of Joachim von Ribbentrop's trip to uh, Moscow, and a continent apart, two scientists would embark on a crucial trip, one that almost didn't happen. This one from New York City to Long Island Sound. Leo Gillard, a leading Hungarian Jewish physicist and a close friend of Einstein, had fled the Nazis, was working at Columbia University in New York City. Einstein was at Princeton, which he once disdainfully described as a, quote, quaint, ceremonious village with puny demigods on stilts. <laughs> oh, you Princeton grads. Uh, but during the summer break, Einstein, an avid sailor who remarkably couldn't swim, uh, was running a cottage on Old Grove Road 
out in the town of Taconic, so-called, because it was on Long Island Sound on the great uh, uh, Conic Bay. And he sailed a boat there called the Tinnip, which means junk. There Einstein was happy as a clam, bought uh, sandals uh, from the local department store and played uh, Bach and Mozart on occasion with the store's owner. Like Einstein, uh, Gillard had never learned to drive. And so he enlisted another brilliant Hungarian Jewish refugee physicist named Eugene Wigner, uh, who was head of the physics department at Princeton, to drive him to one of the most consequential meetings of the 20th century, this one to meet Einstein. Einstein once remarked, only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. <laughs> and at times, I'm not too sure about the universe. <laughs> Credibly, all of the two, the two of the world's most brilliant nuclear physicists on a mission to save the world from Nazi domination could remember they'd been told was that Einstein was renting a cottage from a Dr. Moore in a town somewhere on Long Island that began with a P. They headed for Patchogue. <laughs> Why not? After all, it's on Long Island, it was on the map, it began with a P. But alas, no one in Patchogue had ever heard of Dr. Moore or his cottage. So the two had almost given up on their crucial mission when it occurred to them, brilliant, that there might be other towns starting with P on Long Island. And when they consulted a map, that brilliant mnemonic device led to the sudden recollection Einstein was indeed somewhere in a town called Pecanic, so-called because it was located on the great Pecanic Bay, North Fork of Long Island across from the Hamptons. Any of you may know it. And so the two scientists now dutifully changed their course and headed to the town of Peconic. But in the dead of summer, Peconic is inhabited by weekenders and tourists. No one they encountered on the streets of Peconic had ever heard of a Dr. Moore or of his cottage. So by now, both Gillard and Wigner were fatigued. They were getting desperate. It was a hot, humid summer day. There was no air conditioning. Two scientists were exhausted. Let's go home. Perhaps fate intended it, said Gillard. We were just about to abort their mission when Wigner replied, yeah, but it's our duty to take this step. It was then that Wigner finally had a flash of genius. Why not ask a child? But don't ask him about Dr. Moore, ask him about Einstein. After all, he said every child knows about Einstein and what he looks like. Of course, he was right at the time. I was only nine, but all of us knew just what Einstein looked like. He had wild, woolly hair. He had a deeply lined face, he wore rumpled clothes, and he smoked a pipe. We thought every genius had wild, woolly hair, deeply lined face, wore rumpled clothes, and smoked a pipe, just like that reliable, old-fashioned uh, Swiss watchmaker C.P.A. Snow would describe, who proudly collected butterflies on Sunday. And so the brilliant physicists, in one final desperate act, that moment of revelation just happened upon a seven-year-old child, standing on the corner with a fishing rod, do you know where Einstein lives? The boy replied, of course I do, and promptly led directly to Dr. Moore's cottage. And Einstein. Well, why had Gillard sought out Einstein? Back in July 1939, Einstein, believe it or not, was not in the forefront of experimentation in nuclear physics. He was not even aware of the most recent scientific literature on the subject, nor more importantly, was he aware of the splitting of the atom that had just been accomplished in Germany by a former colleague, Otto Hahn. So why Einstein? Amazingly, Gillard had sought out Einstein because of his perceived ability to network with the Queen of Belgium, an ability not derived from Einstein's uh, uh, genuine genius in physics, but from his musicality. It seems that before Einstein and Nobel, Nobel laureate fled from Nazi Germany, and he often socialized with royalty in Europe. And when he did so, on a number of occasions, he played Bach on the violin, accompanied on the piano by Queen Elizabeth of Belgium. The music proved to be a bond. They became good friends. Since Belgium controlled the world's largest supply of uranium, namely that in the Belgian Congo, Einstein was a large choice to warn the Belgians that they must take immediate steps to safeguard it from the Nazis. At that time, uh, Canada had, had uh, some of it, uh, and uh, Czechoslovakia uh, had some uranium, but the largest supply of all was in the Belgian Congo. So two brilliant physicists 
uh, both in the forefront of nuclear fission experimentation in the Western Hemisphere, and initially embarked on a mission to find perhaps the world's most celebrated Nobel laureate because of his violin virtuosity. Fortunately for the Western world, they found a seven-year-old boy who found Einstein, and just as fortunately, the focus of their mission would soon be altered dramatically. A number of the improbable strands of the circuitous drama that would ultimately lead to Hiroshima were now beginning to come together, although in a serpentine manner. It would happen this way. In Berlin, when Otto Hahn and Fritz Stresemann, both leading physicists, had achieved interesting experimental results by bombarding heavy uranium, neutrons, their results were sent to a former colleague by the name of Lisa Meitner, who had been forced to flee to Sweden just because she was half Jewish. Meitner, in turn, shared these results with her nephew, another physicist named Otto Frisch, and the two of them then concluded that the atom had indeed been split Two lighter nuclei had been created, and a small amount of lost mass had actually been turned into energy. Frisch and Meitner substantiated the results, which they called fission. And they informed their Danish colleague, Niels Bohr, who was about to leave on a short trip to America. Some of you may remember Niels Bohr as the protagonist pitted against the controversial German physicist uh, Werner Heisenberg, also a Nobel laureate, uh, in the riveting drama Copenhagen. Uh, Bohr, who was himself half Jewish, but eventually escaped from Denmark and came per and come permanently to the United States in 1943, where he too would become a significant player in the Manhattan Project. But early in 1939, scientists were still sharing information and writing papers which they all could read. And so Bohr shared Frisch and Meitner's results with a weekly gathering of physicists in Princeton known as the Monday Evening Club. Oh, you say, that's where Einstein learned about it. Not at all. <laughs> Significantly, although Einstein was at Princeton, he was not even a part of that group. And he remained somewhat aloof from his old friend, Niels Bohr, during Bohr's visit, engaging only in small talk with Bohr. Following that gathering of scientists, however, in Princeton, physician, physicists now began churning out papers on the subject of nuclear fission. No government restriction at that point yet. At the time, Einstein was engaged in a search for the unification of gravitation and electromagnetism, or what he called a unified field theory. It was a search which many physicists regarded as quixotic, but it was at one with Einstein's intuitive conviction that there was an order in the universe, that nature was not random or chaotic. There was a unified field theory that it would lead him to uncover what he turned to be an underlying reality. This search was Einstein's holy grail. It was tantalizing but torturous <clears throat> search. I feel like a kid, he said, who cannot get the hang of the ABCs, even though, strangely enough, I do not abandon hope, wrote to his friend Max Lau. After all, said Einstein, one is dealing here with a sphinx, not with a willing streetwalker. And so, as a recent Einstein biographer, Walter Isaacson, uh, concluded, Einstein beat on against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Isaacson's uh, metaphor, incidentally, I realized that seen once before, parallels the last uh, line of the great Gatsby, Fitzgerald. But as Einstein waged his never-ending uh, crusade against the quantum theorists, who seemed wedded to probabilities and averse to believing in an underlying reality, he was becoming increasingly detached from the new experimental discoveries. Einstein had long been skeptical about the possibility of harnessing atomic energy or unleashing the power implied by his most revolutionary formula, E equals mc squared. Energy equals the ma equals mass times the speed of light squared. Showing that mass and energy were interchangeable, which meant that a small amount of matter could be converted into large amounts of energy. <coughs> Notwithstanding his famous finding, Einstein interviewed in Pittsburgh as late as 1934, still insisted that the possibility of harnessing atomic energy and unleashing the power applied by E equal MC squared and splitting the atom by bombardment was, quote, akin to shooting birds in a dark place where there are only a few birds. 
adding results so far concerning splitting of the atom do not justify assumption of a practical utilization of the energies released. End quote. With the news in 1939 that it was apparently very possible to embark and split the atom, Einstein's interest was aroused. But in July 1939, as the chance seven-year-old just happened upon by Wigner and Gillard would fortuitously point the way to Dr. Moore's cottage, Einstein was by no means on the leading edge of developments in the field. Gillard was. Einstein was about to be shaken to his core. And his violin virtuosity, that was about to become irrelevant. Biographer Walter Isaacson describes the meeting. Sitting at a bare table, on a screen porch of a sparsely furnished cottage, Gillard explained the process of how an explosive chain reaction could be produced in uranium layered with graphite by the neutrons released from nuclear fission. I never thought of that, Einstein interjected, but he immediately grasped the horrifying implication of what he was being told. In his memoirs, Eugene Wigner would point to this moment. Einstein he said, almost immediately grasped the political and military meaning of nuclear fishing. That it could yield explosions strong enough to make the Nazis invisible. And Einstein was just as horrified as I was, says Wigner, uh, by that point. Volunteered to do whatever he could to prevent it. Well, now at that point, only now were the horrifying ramifications of his 1905 formulation E equals mc squared, and what was to follow in its wake becoming to be, begin to become graphically clear. The prospect of an atomic bomb in the hands of a psychopath who had joined a group of four nobodies uh, meeting under a gas lamp or on a broken table in 1939, just as Einstein was being hailed by the Royal Academy, but who had already brought half of Europe to its knees, that was enough to Einstein in that searing moment overcome a lifetime devoted to pacifism the world federalism. What to do? Gillard had initially proposed that Einstein write to his friend Queen Elizabeth of Belgium. Einstein, however, suggested that they write maybe to a Belgian minister with whom he was acquainted instead. Wigner sensibly pointed out that three refugees really should not be dealing in foreign affairs without notifying the State Department. So the three physicists concluded that Einstein would write a letter to the Belgian ambassador about the uranium and forward a copy with a cover note to our State Department. He dictated a letter in German to Wigner. Wigner later uh, had his secretary type a draft in English, sent it on to uh, Gillard for Einstein's review. Wigner left on a trip for California. Exit Wigner, enter Alexander Sachs and Edward Teller. Now the mission changes dramatically. But all this was going on. Gillard had fortuitously been introduced Alexander Sachs, a close friend and an unofficial advisor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Sachs, 40 year, 46 years old, was a wunderkind. He was a person who looked and sounded very much like comedian Ed Wynn. Uh, he was born in Russia, came to the United States when he was 11, graduated Columbia at 19, uh, pursued philosophy, jurisprudence, and sociology, and prestigious fellowships at Harvard, was an economic advisor to Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, in his campaigns, worked for him in the NRA, was now an economist with Lehman Brothers. More significantly than all of it, Roosevelt called on him for opinions from time to time. Now, Sachs, who had the president's ear, uh, tended, however, to be a little bit verbose and often spoke in florid prose and parables. Sachs convinced Shalar a letter should be addressed directly to FDR and promised that if it were, he, Sachs, would personally deliver. A major Rubicon had now been crossed. Einstein agreed, and so Gillard went back to see him to redraft the letter, formerly intended for the Belgian ambassador. But the nature of the undertaking had now been addressed. Sachs knew instinctively that Einstein's fame must now be used to bring the entire question of atomic research to the attention of the President of the United States. Attention the Queen of Belgium and her ministers is now secondary. It was there, secondary. With Wigner now in California, Gillard drafted Edward Teller, another Hungarian Jewish refugee physicist uh, who was now teaching at George Washington University as a chauffeur. And Teller, who, like Gillard, was destined to become a prominent player in the Manhattan Project, once quipped about this chance circumstance, 
I entered history as a large chauffeur. The final form of the letter, dated August 2, 1939, incorporated a great deal from the letter Einstein initially dictated the Belgian ambassador, but it now went far beyond the initial scope uh, of merely securing uranium. The letter which many have dubbed one of the most uh, consequential in modern history, uh, in which Einstein, toward the end of his life, would describe as the greatest mistake of my life, starts off innocently enough. First paragraph, Einstein simply informs the president that recent work by Enrico Fermi and Lee Gillard leads Einstein to suspect that uranium may soon be turned into an important source of energy. Uh, so far, Einstein could simply have been describing a new peaceful source of energy. Goes on in the second paragraph to further elaborate on the likely generation of power from that source, but he still hasn't reached critical mass. The first sentence of the third paragraph finally hits the mark. This new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of bombs. There it is, stark, read horrifying. Einstein then goes on to describe the possible massive destructive power of such a bomb being delivered to a port by a ship, since it was probably too heavy, thought uh, to be delivered by a plane. Then it goes to the point that originally impelled Gillard and Winger to seek him out of Peconic, the safeguarding of world uranium ore supplies. Urges then the FDR appoint a liaison between the physicists and the administration to both keep the government informed and speed up experimental work, which was beyond the budgetary limitations and capabilities of the university or universities where it was then being carried out. Sachs, of course, had himself in mind for this position. The last paragraph is the sense of coup de grace and the hook. For in it, informs FDR that Germany has stopped the export of uranium from Czechoslovakia and that the son of the German Undersecretary of State, von Wassacher, is attached to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. It's a chemical inst chemistry institute where some of the American work on uranium is being repeated. That's certainly an attention grabber, but it became more so as events in Europe developed between the time the final draft of the letter was completed in August 1939 and the time it was finally delivered to FDR on October 11, 1939, for war had broken out in Europe. I sought out the original letter, I've given copies to, uh, to you, uh, of. the letter resides in the, um, in the FDR library at Hyde Park, it's a wonderful library you should all visit. It's reproduced on its website, signature immediately caught my eye. It's diminutive, about half as large as the type that surrounds it. Now, I make no pretense to being a handwriting expert, uh, but the very size of the signature alone conveys to me the hesitancy of perhaps the most astute, intuitive mind of the 20th century, a man uh, who had devoted a lifetime to the cause of capitalism, shrinking the sudden realization of the chain reaction uh, of human and scientific events that he was about to set in motion, the uncertainty about where it would lead and the excruciating suffering must eventually follow. All of this, Einstein saw in that instant, the conic. Of course, he was right. Now, Einstein was a man so gentle of nature uh, that he disliked even playing chess. His instincts led him to espouse one world federalism, socialism, both during the World War I and after. It's a theme that he would return to time and again during his lifetime. An organizer, petition signer, Ironically, it's one of the factors which would deny perhaps the world's greatest scientific genius security clearance in 1940 uh, and access to the very Manhattan Project uh, that his letter would launch. Einstein understood the consequences of his colleague Fritz Haber's uh, invention of chlorine gas, Haber's personal supervision of its use in the trenches at Ypres in 1915, those same trenches from which uh, the unforgettable poem in Flanders Fields which we visited in our second session, they emerged. Einstein knew only too well that Haber's gas had resulted in the painful asphyxiation of over 5,000 French and Belgian soldiers by burning through their throats and lungs and causing their agonizing deaths in so horrible a manner that poison gas would ultimately be banned by the Geneva Conventions. He remembered, too, the awful sense of responsibility for the gassing in Ypres, and that ultimately led Haber's wife, Claire Immerwar, uh, who was also a chemist, to commit suicide when her pleas to Haber to cease work on the poison gas were rejected by him in a rage of German patriotism. And as he signed that letter, dated August 2, 
1939, the clairvoyant Einstein could no doubt already envision the much greater catastrophe that awaited some unfortunate but as yet undesignated segment of mankind as a result of his act that day, as indeed it would almost exactly six years later. And there was something else. Einstein knew, too, that in signing a letter, he was himself becoming an integral part of the indeterminacy that he had not only dreaded, but that he had fought to disprove all of his adult life. He must have known that he was now himself being forced by circumstances to become part of an uncontrollable process that would ultimately hurtle mankind toward an abyss of chaos. He must have felt viscerally that his signature would unleash a chain of unpredictable but unstoppable events more akin to Heisinger's uncertainty principle and to his own search for a unified field theory for an underlying <coughs> order in the universe. Trying to determine whether or not Sachs would be the best messenger, Gillard uh, and Einstein considered, among others, Bernard Baruch, the financier, Carl Compton, who was president of MIT. Incredibly, they also seriously considered Charles Lindbergh. They considered Charles Lindbergh so seriously, in fact, that Gillard actually drafted a letter to Lindbergh on the same day he delivered the letter to Sachs, uh, to deliver to the letter to Sachs, telling him, deliver to FDR tomorrow or return it. Of course, Sachs did neither. Lindbergh did not respond on September 13th, since Sachs had not yet gotten the letter uh, before FDR. Gillard wrote Lindbergh a reminder letter. Lindbergh, of course, was the worst possible choice for the scientists. The aviator hero was by this time a confirmed Nazi sympathizer and a leading isolationist, as we've seen throughout this course. None of this was known to the naive physicists. Fortunately for developments, while they were debating messenger qualifications, Lindbergh chose this time uh, to deliver an address on national radio, which has been described as a clarion call for isolationism. And overtones of pro-German, anti-Roosevelt, and anti-Semitic sentiments as well. Zillard quickly terminated all efforts to reach Lindbergh. All three now realized how guileless they had been. Sachs was now their only hope. But by October 1, Sachs had not been given an audience for that time by FDR. Developments in Europe had rapidly intervened to frustrate his attempts to see the president. A week after the molotov ribbentrop Pact, of course, the Wehrmacht had invaded Poland with instructions uh, from the Fuhrer to close your hearts to pity and act rudely. Britain and France, bound by the treaty to defend Poland, had entered the war. FDR was desperately trying to weave his way in and around the neutrality acts, as we've seen before, and the arms embargoes in order to arm Britain. On September 11th, he began his extensive correspondence with Churchill, who was to soon to respond at length over the ensuing six years from deep in the underground war rooms, uh, cabinet war rooms in London. FDR was too preoccupied to see Sachs. The scientists decided to give Sachs 10 more days until October 11th for pulling the letters back. Sachs just made the deadline on the final day. During this interim, the German War Office had taken over the work on nuclear fission begun by the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. And the German atomic bomb project was now well begun. Richard Rhodes, in a seminal work on the subject, the making of the atomic bomb, which I've included in the syllabus, which was handed out, describes a curious concurrent phenomenon. Now, German scientist Karl von Weishaupt featured in Einstein's letter, and Otto Hahn, the scientist who first split the atom, had the same mixed emotions about the project ultimately shared by Einstein and the Hungarian scientist Gillard and Wigner in the United States. Said Weishaupt, the atomic bomb exists in the minds of some men. It will soon make its appearance. If this is so, then the participating nation and ultimately mankind itself can only survive if war as an institution is abolished. I'm convinced that this reflects precisely Einstein's sentiments as he signed that fateful letter, but with a diminutive signature. Rose goes on to conclude, both sides might work from fear of the other. Of course, we had that, mad, mutually assured destruction. But some on both sides would be working also paradoxically believing that they were preparing a new force that would ultimately bring peace to the world. On October 11th, just as Gillard had begun pursuing avenues of contact with <coughs> President Carl Compton, Sachs finally got his coveted audience with FDR. 
Alex, what have you been up to? Bellowed FDR. Sachs, who had meticulously prepared for this moment, now launched into a parable. There was a young inventor, uh, he recounted, who once wrote a letter to Napoleon proposing to build him a fleet of ships that carried no sails and which could land Napoleon's armies in England in any weather. Napoleon scoffed, ship without sails, bah, away with your visionists. The young inventor, of course, was Robert Fulton. I had, said Sachs, an equivalent of the young inventor's steamboat proposal. Always a genial host, FDR scribbled a note to an aide who shortly returned with a cherished family treasure, a rare, unopened bottle of Napoleon brandy. <laughs> FDR promptly broke out into glasses. But Sachs, tearful that FDR would simply put the letter aside and then read, then read to FDR an 800-word memorandum that he'd prepare in layman's language, summarizing the potential uses of atomic energy for power production, medicine, and finally, to produce bombs of hitherto unenvisaged potency and scope. To the entire presentation, FDR turned to Sachs and said, Alice, what you're after is that the Nazis don't blow us up. Precisely, said Sachs. FDR turned to his chief of staff, Paul Watson. Paul, this requires action, he said. And action ensued, but hardly enough. Watson soon established a committee headed by the director of the Bureau of Standards, which is the US government uh, physics laboratory. His name was Dr. Lyman Briggs, Johns Hopkins PhD, along with scientists and military representatives. The first meeting of the committee was attended by Gillard, his two chauffeurs, Teller and Wigner, Briggs, and military representatives. Einstein did not want to be involved, but that proved to be irrelevant. J. Edgar Hoover had already compiled a dossier on Einstein, branding him as a dangerous pacifist, a world federalist, denying him security clearance. Thus, the anomaly. The author of the letter was to launch. The Manhattan Project was not allowed by security to participate in it. And America was, of course, deprived of its genius in its development. But at the time, our nation was not at war. Isolationist sentiment, as we've seen in my other uh, talks here, was strong. Our military was ranked 17th uh, in the world and was equipped with antiquated World War equipment, uh, rifles and ammunition. Although Britain had declared war in Germany and was busy uh, building radar stations and spitfires and air raid shelters. There was already talk of a phony war in, uh, in Eastern Europe, not in Western Europe. So ironically, there was significant opposition by our military representatives on the committee to proceeding with large-scale research. And the committee's work dragged along, believe it or not, with a total budget of $6,000 into the spring of 1940. Time had come for Gillard, who was the prime mover in the endeavor, the way in again, and again he did this over Einstein's signature. There would be four letters in all addressed by Einstein to the president, uh, three warned of the tragic dangers of falling behind. The German atomic research had now been taken over by the German government. However, uh, 1941, finally, Einstein gradually became aware that Gillard, Wigner, Teller, and other physicists such as Robert Oppenheimer, had begun to disappear from view and into obscure towns. As if preordained by fate, the Manhattan Project was finally launched on December 6, 1941, the day before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Einstein, who had been denied security clearance, could only surmise what was happening in the distance. Tragically, Einstein's fourth letter failed to reach the president's desk in time before FDR's death on April 12, 1945. By this time, the Manhattan Project had taken on life of its own. Under General Leslie Groves, the Army would brook no interference from scientists or anyone else now who sought to limit the use of the bomb. General Groves clashed with Leo Gillard, who he described as the kind of man, quote, that any employer would have fired as a troublemaker. Doubted Gillard's loyalty. By the spring of 45, Gillard had indeed begun to examine the wisdom of testing bombs and using bombs. The breakthrough of the Allied armies into Germany, documents had now been discovered in Strasbourg, revealing that Germany was two years behind the United States in atomic research. Hitler, it seems, had chosen to concentrate on weaponry that could be put for immediate use in the field, the B-1, B-2 rockets. German atomic fission research had fallen far behind uh, or been shelled. 
Gillard was now more convinced than ever that atomic weaponry should not be used against Japan or anyone else for that matter. No point in talking to General Leslie Groves in March of 1945. Secrecy barred communication with any mid-level authorities in the Manhattan Project. The only man with whom he was entitled to communicate was FDR, Gillard reasoned. And to this end, he prepared a memorandum over the signature of Albert Einstein, but this time to a very different end than the previous three letters. Gillard felt that he knew FDR. And the Japanese had dug in 21,000 men on Iwo Jima, where they would eventually lose almost all 21,000 in a fight to the better end. The US military proposed sanitizing the island by lobbing artillery shells loaded with poison gas uh, onto the island from ships offshore. Geneva Convention be damned. FDR had vetoed the plan. FDR was the only kindred spirit in power whom Gillard felt he could uh, approach. Einstein was aware by this time that Gillard's sentiments uh, about use of the bomb matched his own. The letter secured Gillard a, an appointment, not with FDR, with Eleanor Roosevelt, which had been scheduled for May 8, 1945, but FDR died on April 12th. The meeting with Eleanor Roosevelt never took place, so large as ultimately referred by Harry S. Truman to James Burns. Now, Burns was a crusty friend of uh, Truman's, who's now a private citizen living in uh, South Carolina, became uh, attorney, uh, Secretary of State uh, on July 3, 1945, and eventually was a uh, destined to become a major player in the ensuing negotiations, which determined the ultimate fate of the atomic bomb. The memorandum which Gillard, together with other Nobel laureates, prepared, presented to Burns in his home in South Carolina, argued that the United States should refrain from using the bomb, not on moral grounds, but because its use would very soon lead to its replication by other nations, causing the United States to lose its preeminence in armaments production. Along with scientists such as Niels Bohr, Zillard was urging the government to visualize the situation which would confront the United States a few years from now. Arguments fell on deaf ears. Burns, a 45-year political veteran, was unimpressed. Also under the impression the use of the bomb would make Russia, which had already occupied Hungary and Romania, much more malleable and manageable. In fact, the target choosing committee under General Curtis LeMay had already been set up was working through Japanese cities, choosing the luckless targets. Truman had convinced himself that it was possible to choose legitimate military targets. And indeed, Hiroshima was a center of military activity. The Japanese Second Army was headquartered in Hiroshima. Hiroshima was slated by the Japanese High Command to serve as a marshaling area for troops to defend against the Allied invasion, which was expected soon. In August 2, 1945, six years to the day, following Einstein's letter to FDR, Little Boy, the atomic bomb that would destroy Hiroshima, arrived at Tinian. Tinian Island, a little picturesque little island in the Pacific, 6,000 miles from San Francisco, shaped like the island of Manhattan, was to serve as the launching point for the attack. When young Paul Tibbetts was in college, uh, studying to be a doctor, one day he surprisingly announced to his parents he wanted to fly. Uh, his father, who was a strict disciplinarian, objected uh, strongly. Don't kill yourself in an airplane, son. Tempers flare. Uh, but his mother, born Enola Gay Haggard, interjected. She said, you go ahead and fly. You'll be all right, son. Tibbetts would become the most talented B-29 pilot in the Second World War and never forgot. He would name his plane after her, and her name, Enola Gay, derived from a character in a novel her father had read, was destined to become synonymous with delivery of the most destructive weapon in the history of modern warfare. When the bomb bay doors of the Enola Gay opened over Hiroshima on August 5, 1945, just six years and three days after Einstein's letter, when the bomb left the plane, the aircraft jumped. It had just been relieved four times, 9,000 pounds. The plane was already a lot, uh, 11 miles away from the drop point, and a bright light filled the plane, and a blast shook it violently. We turned back to see Hiroshima, said the shaken tail gunner. The city was hidden by that awful cloud boiling up, mushrooming terrible and incredibly tall. Where we'd seen a clear city two minutes before, we no longer see the city. All we could see was smoke and fires creeping up the sides of the mountain, like a pot of boiling black oil. 
looked like lava or molasses covering the whole city. On the ground accompanying the instantaneous flash of light was an in instantaneous flash of heat. The temperature on a person's skin, two to three miles from the blast, raised to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit in a millisecond. The temperature on the site of the explosion reached 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. People exposed within a half mile of the little boy fireball were seared with bundles of smoking black ash in a fraction of a second. Thousands of the small black bundles that had been humans only seconds before are now stuck to bridges and streets in erosion. Where the city stood, everything as far as the eye could see was a waste of ashes, ruin. I climbed Ikiyama Hill and looked down, said a history professor. I saw Hiroshima had disappeared. Hiroshima had just ceased to exist. Tibbetts, who piloted the Enola Gave, died in 2007 at the age of 92. Never regretted dropping the bomb on Hiroshima, but he directed in his will that no funeral be held or any headstone erected, lest his gravesite become a mecca for anti nuke pilgrims. Both Einstein and Gillard were mortified when they heard the news that the bomb had dropped. Oh, God, explained Einstein, was all he could utter. Stunned, enveloped by overwhelming sadness. Uh, his erstwhile German colleagues, Otto Hahn, Max von Lau, turned now in a state of rural British countryside, were like by shattered and depressed beyond measure. Said Hahn, the thought of the unspeakable misery of countless innocent women, children, something I could scarcely bear. He contemplated suicide. He, of course, had been the first to split the atom. Of course, the war would soon end, but not until another atomic bomb named Fat Man had been dropped in Nagasaki. If it had gone on any longer, wrote Yukio Mishima, the Japanese writer, that there would have been nothing but to do but go mad. No doubt, uh, many hundreds of thousands of both Japanese and American lives were saved, spared by this happening, uh, but it may have been a, a necessity, a fortunate necessity. Einstein's involvement in the actual construction of the bomb was, of course, itself marginal. But a history of the making of the bomb released by the United States government Immediately following Nagasaki, much to Einstein's dismay, signed great historic weight in the launch of the Manhattan Project in his 1939 letter with a diminutive signature. Shortly after the bomb was dropped, his picture would appear on the cover of Time magazine, together with a mushroom-shaped cloud inscribed with E equals MC squared. The lead story, edited by Whitaker Chambers, later out at Alder, Alder Hiss, dramatically noted the following. Through the incomparable blast and flame that will follow, there will be dimly discernible to those who are interested in cause and effect in history, the features of a shy, almost saintly, childlike little man with the soft brown eyes, the drooping facial lines of a world-weary hound and hair like an aurora borealis. So that incomparable visage, C.P. Snow's reliable old Swiss watcher. The one cut out of rotor gravure sections of the Sunday papers, pinned to children's bedroom walls by hopeful mothers, the familiarity of which enabled a seven-year-old child encountered by chance two of the nation's leading physicists, Einstein and great Connick Bay. That visage of a man who had devoted his life to the quest for order in the universe was now ironically to be equated by humankind with the most demonic structure ever devised by man. So it was that the concurrence of two fateful trips in the summer of 39 would foreshadow an unspeakable cataclysm six years later. One perhaps necessary, but one so indiscriminate and so random in its horror and destruction that it would shake the world we live in to its core. So the picture I've been painting over these last six sessions, finally finished, the paint's now dry, but it's of course far from complete. The America of my formative years, the troubled uh, yet exciting America of the late 30s, the heroic uh, America of the war years, now emerged in my adolescence as the world's only nuclear power, a status that we've not remained static for very long, as the nuclear arms race so dreaded by Einstein so accurately predicted by his colleagues would now begin and become a force so powerful that its global containment would dominate the thinking of our governance and our destiny to the present day. 
threat of nuclear annihilation that permanently altered America's role in the world. Einstein's letter had launched an inexorable march. The luxury of isolationism was no longer an option for America. We had emerged as a global superpower for all that that would apply. Walter Isaacson concluded that Einstein's beliefs seemed to arise from a sense of awe and transcendent order <coughs> that he had discovered in the universe. This faith in the orderless universe defined his later life. And he was, in fact, still scribbling equations, seeking the solution to it as he lay dying. Like Fitzgerald's Gatsby, Walter Isaacson's Albert Einstein, we all seem to be destined to continue to beat on, boats against the current, born ceaselessly into the past. And like Einstein, our human condition is such that we are destined as well to continue to search for the holy grail of order in this chaotic universe. Einstein once uttered, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. A phrase now enshrined over a fireplace in Princeton University. It is, of course, our fervent hope and our prayer that Einstein's theorem, this Einstein theorem, will ultimately prove as prescient as E equals MC squared. Subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working with you all. You've been a great class. Uh, any thoughts, comments? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I just want to ask you something. Sure. In the early years, you said the physicists and the scientists all disappeared. Yes, they did. They don't do that anymore. No, they don't. So you said that uh, they were naive about someone like uh, Charles Lindbergh. They sure they were. Didn't read? Well, and that, that's an amazing question. Uh, I think they were so involved in their scientific research that, yes, they didn't. Uh, they really didn't know about Lindbergh. They had no idea what he was up to. And yet he was a very active figure in the uh, America First movement, the isolationist movement. Yeah, true. And yes, they did share information at that time. Uh, Germany put a stop to it very shortly after uh, they invaded the, uh, uh, this happened and they invaded Poland. Uh, Art, yes. The search for somebody to bring the information to Roosevelt <clears throat> was really key in looking about it. It may have been the reason they were looking for Lindbergh because he was well known and highly respected. Heller told me that it was Shalad who wrote the letter. Till our, they needed yeah. somebody from it yeah. who was respected and, and would be listened to. Yeah. Uh, that none of them had that denied. That's the reason they chose Einstein. And, and yeah. they, they came to Einstein. Basically, the, the letter belonged to Gillard. Yeah, it was. Gillard and uh, Sachs had some input. You're absolutely right. Leo Gillard was really the motivating force, the prime mover in all of this. Uh, I think Wigner may have had some input the first time. Teller may have had some input uh, later on. Alexander Sachs had input in wanting to set up that commission because he wanted to be on that commission. He wanted to head that commission. But the whole tenor of what they were after changed when Sachs got into the picture. And now it became a question of Einstein's fame getting it before the president, uh, uh, but not on the question of uranium so much as the question of atomic research. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes. Could you give us uh, your views of Oppenheimer's role in the Manhattan Project and uh, the feeling of this discussion of his fate? Uh, his discussion of what? His role I got, and what was the last? And, and uh, the fact that he got fired, you know, the circumstances of him. I think that's beyond my uh, beyond my grade here, uh, uh, pay grade at the point at the moment. I'm not an expert on Oppenheimer. I've probably seen the things that you've seen on it. Uh, but uh, Oppenheimer's uh, uh, loyalty uh, was severely in question. Uh, to what extent uh, they were right, to what extent they were wrong, I'll never know. Now, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but uh, Oppenheimer was, of course, one of the prime movers, if not the prime mover in the project with uh, Gillard before Gillard really tailed off at the end. Uh, and uh, 
but he was not one of the prime movers in the nutrigen, in the bomb, in the work after the atomic bomb. Uh, others came to the fore during that time, Teller being one of them, by the way. Yeah? Follow through for us, if you would, the Queen uh, of Belgium and the war. Did that take place? Was there a connection between yes. the government and yes. Belgium? Yes, because Belgium at that time, the question was for those in, uh, in uh, Great Barrington, the question is what's the connection between the Queen of Belgium and the war? The answer to that is that the largest supply of uranium ore in the world was in the Belgian Congo. At that time, we're now prior to the time that, that Germany invaded Belgium, okay? They were now fighting uh, on the Eastern Front, Poland. Uh, and uh, they, they wanted to warn the Queen of Belgium that they must protect that uranium supply uh, in, uh, in the Belgian Congo and keep it away from Germany. Uh, and uh, the other main supply, unfortunately, was Czechoslovakia. And the fact that Britain had now, uh, Germany had now prevented the uh, uranium ore, uranium ore from being shipped out of Czechoslovakia, uh, meant to these scientists that Germany was hot on the trail of atomic research at that point and ahead of us, or concerned that they were ahead of us. Otto Hahn had, was a German and he had, in fact, uh, done the uh, splitting of the atom. Unfortunately for us, he came over to our side. Uh, and fortunately for us, eventually, German uh, uh, work on the atomic uh, bomb trailed off uh, because of Hitler uh, and Hitler's priorities. Yes? Following up, yeah. up, following up on the same question. Yes. What happened with that Belgian Congo supply? Did, did Germany stop? Yes. What happened? They invaded Belgium or what? You know, I think Germany would have controlled it, could have controlled it, but by the time they did, it was not in the forefront of what they were doing. And our supplies came from Canada. Canada had significant supply, and we utilized that uh, in, in our research and our work on the atomic bomb. Yes, ma'am? Einstein was not part of Manhattan. No, Einstein was not part of the Manhattan Project. There was one time where they came to him without telling him what they were doing and how they were doing it to solve one mathematical equation. Why did they keep going? Why what? Why did they keep him out of it? Why they kept him out of it? J. Edgar Hoover was a very suspicious fellow. Uh, and num there were a number of things about Einstein that, that brought, uh, made him suspicious to J. Edgar Hoover. Number one, he was Jewish. That was bad. Number two, he was a liberal. That was even worse. Number three, he was a world federalist type of person and a pacifist and had made a number of remarks to that effect. He was also a petition signer, God help us. He put his name on everything and uh, it was just unfortunate. Well, Hoover now had a dossier like that and to him, uh, Einstein was a d distinct security threat. And so he had to be out. He had to be kept out. Yes, ma'am. Also, that Einstein, it wasn't Einstein's field. It wasn't Einstein's field. That's correct. It wasn't. Einstein could have gotten up to speed on it pretty quickly, i got to tell you, but, uh, uh, and, and did understand immediately the ramifications of it the minute uh, they, uh, they told him what was going on with Otto Hahn and so forth as he was writing that letter. Yes. Uh, a bunch of hands were up. Yes, sir. The engaging thing is that Hoover had that kind of power. Hoover had enormous power, immense power, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's almost difficult to understand how one man could really uh, uh, so influence and so uh, uh, completely dominate uh, the security scene in the United States. But he did for years, from the late 20s until his death, basically almost until his death. Amazing, and he had that power. Uh, am I missing any questions from Great Barrington? Anybody there with a hand up? Uh, it's hard for me to see. Okay, I just want to leave you out. Okay, yes, Sue. What, what, where are the sources of uranium today? What has happened? Uranium in the world today. Tell you the truth, I think they're using other uh, uh, sources of ore today uh, for the bombs that they're using now. But <coughs> Czechoslovakia still has uranium. Canada still has uranium ore. And, and Africa, Africa, certainly. Africa, I'm sure there, there are sources. There, there's plenty of uranium in Africa. Yeah. And one other question. How old was Roosevelt when he died? Roosevelt, I believe. Not positive. He's right around 60, 59, 60, 62, 61. Yeah, right around the early 60s when he died. Uh, or a cerebral hemorrhage in, uh, in Georgia. Yes? How large a role did the Fermi play? Fermi, a la very large role. You can see him noted in the uh, beginning of the letter. Fermi was married to a Jewish woman, by the way, and he eventually came over as a result of that from Italy. Yeah, he played a large role in the Manhattan Project. And you can see him uh, uh, noted in the, first, uh, in the first sentence of the letter. Yes, Enrico Fermi had a major, major role. 
Yeah, any others? Okay, it's been great working with you. God bless you all. Thank you.